Hi, my name is Stuart Lynch, and in this video I'm going to show you the difference between using an if condition and a guard condition. We'll look at the pros and cons of each while looking at execution flow, unwrapping optionals, and dealing with throwing errors. If this is something you want to learn, then keep watching. I love getting your feedback, so tap the thumbs up button if you enjoyed this video and leave a comment below. Make sure you subscribe to the video and ring that bell to get notifications of new videos. And if you want to support my work, you can buy me a coffee. I have a starter playground for this project and I recommend that you download it from the link in the description and work along with me. At the end you'll have a nice reference playground that you can refer to in the future. There are three pages in this playground and, as I normally do, I've included a function that you can find in the Sources folder. The function will print out the title of the example and uses a closure so that I can keep all code contained and reuse functions and variables of the same name on the same playground page. If you're not viewing the markup version of this page and instead it looks like this, make sure you choose Show Rendered Markup from the Editor menu. I switch back and forth so often that I've added my own keyboard shortcut for that option. If you do not have a navigation pane open, you can always use the navigation links to move between pages. So let's start at the beginning with execution flow. Consider this person struct that provides properties that might be something you'll find on a job application form. We want to be able to create a function that will filter out only possible candidates to interview. One typically looks for positive qualities when doing comparisons, so our example here where we're trying to evaluate a candidate for a position, we can try to see if they have a particular set of qualifications. We're not going to interview unless they are 21 years or older, female, and have SwiftUI as one of their skills. If they don't have that, we'll reject them. In the first example, we'll look at nested if statements. If they have one of the criteria, we'll keep that in mind and then move on to the next criteria and check again until all of our criteria are evaluated. With if, this is known as a nested loop. And in our case, we have to go three levels deep before we can finally return true. So let's do that. We'll start if person.age is greater than 20, and then if so, if person.gender equals female. If that condition is made, we'll check if person.skills contains the Swift UI enum case, and then finally we can return true. If not all of these conditions are met outside of our nest, we return false because we would have broken out of the nest at any one of those three condition checks. So let's check. In the default case for our person, Mary, she meets all of the criteria, so it returns and prints true. Let's change our criteria one at a time and see what the results are. In each case, if our criteria does not match what is required, it's going to print false. And let's return back to that positive match. I think you'll see that if there is more criteria, the more tests you get, you enter what is affectionately known as the Pyramid of Doom. And this is where the guard statement comes in handy. First, let me copy Mary down to our next example. The guard statement in Swift helps you return your functions early if a condition isn't satisfied. One of the ways that I distinguish between the use of if-else statements and guard-else statements is my outlook on life. I like to think positive, and that's how I think of guard branching. The syntax of the guard statement is this. Here, expression returns either true or false, and if the expression evaluates to true, the statements inside the block of guard are not executed and it moves on. If it evaluates to false, the statements inside the code block of the guard are executed. And the one thing that guards have 
is always an else for the case where it evaluates to false, and we must use either a return, a break, or continue, or throw to exit the scope and potentially the function if it's evaluated as false. Using a guard structure, we don't nest our evaluations. We check if the criteria matches, and then reject immediately if the criteria is not matched before moving on. So for example, we can do this for our age with guard. Else, it's always a failure case, so we'll return false immediately and exit the function. And you'll often see this on a single line, just like this. Let's do the same for the other two criteria. We'll return false with each of the else clauses. Now, if we successfully made it this far, our person must be a match, so we can return true. So let's test. And indeed, Mary should be interviewed. If we change one or more of the criteria, we can evaluate again. And in this case, the candidate will fail, and we won't interview. Now you decide which of these two functions is easier to read. Guard versus if is often a developer choice. I personally find myself leaning more and more towards guard statements for readability. What I really like about this is that we're really looking for a positive criteria right away and reject immediately. Now, moving on to the third example on this page, you may have realized that we could have done a similar thing with an if statement using else, like this. The difference is that we need to reverse our logic and think negatively. So, to check the person's age criteria, we have to reverse it to be less than 21 will return false. And we'll need similar negative criteria checks for the other two. Testing once more, you'll see that this works just as well, including when we change one of the criteria to reject the candidate. Now this looks pretty similar to the previous example, but I prefer the guard else construct because I prefer to think positively. Asif Khan says in his blog, and I'll leave a link to it here, that the guard is natural. Guard that is true or else syntax reads naturally in English, which makes it easier to comprehend what the code does. It's strict, whereas you can only use guard to escape the scope. And by that, we mean transfer the program out of the scope when return, break, etc. is made. Making this explicit makes the control flow of your code clearer. And it motivates an early return. The explicit guard statement returns the function early. Design choices that make coding safer and more productive can be seen throughout the Swift language. You'll need to decide for yourself what works best for you. Another use for guard statements is when we're dealing with optional values. Consider this function that will try to retrieve a name from an array of two names. The catch is that, based on this Boolean value, it might fail and return nil instead. The challenge is to write a function that will call the getName function to retrieve the name, or not, and then reverse it. If it fetches the full name, it returns the last name, followed by a comma, followed by the first name. If it fetches only a single name, it returns just that name. And if it returns nil, we'll return no name. So let's do that using if statements first. If I first assign a property name to the return string from the getName function, I can option click on it to check the type. And I see that it's an optional string because it could possibly return nil. And in Swift, we can use if let to unwrap that string if it's not optional. So if I option click once more, it shows that we no longer have an optional name property. So within that if clause, we can continue building our function. Now, I want to break up our name into components as an array 
where the strings are the ones separated by a space. Then, if there are two components, which there will be if it was Stuart Lynch, we can return the second item in the array, named components1, followed by a comma, and then the first item. Now, still within that clause, we now know that there must only be one name in the array. And this is a simple example that I created just for this purpose. So we can return just the first item of that array. Now, if this original if let check was false, meaning we had an optional value, we're outside of our if loop. So we'll return no name. Now we can execute this code and it will print the reverse name. On our first run, it was not optional, and the name was the single Stuart. And that's all that gets printed out, exactly as I wanted. On the second attempt, it returned nil, so it printed out no name. The third attempt, I got nil again. Remember, that's just a random generation. On the fourth, however, in my case, the name was Stuart Lynch, and it successfully reversed as Lynch, Stuart. So let's see if we can make this more readable using guard. With guard, remember, the else statement is always the negative result. So we can use guard let to unwrap and return the results from get name, and now it will no longer be optional. And if it was, that's a negative result, so we'll return no name. So now we can proceed directly on to creating and extracting the name components just like before. Then instead of an if clause to check the count, I'll use a guard statement, and the negative case would be only if one name existed. So we can return that first item of our name components array. Now if we got this far, there must be two names. So we can return exactly what we created above in that if clause. So let's test. This time the first attempt returns Stuart and it prints it out as expected. Second attempt, it's nil, so no name. Third attempt gives me Stuart again. And then again, on our fourth attempt, we get both names, and it successfully reverses in the printout. So again, you be the judge. What's clearer code for you to understand? I know what is for me. In Swift, there's an error handling model that uses a do, try, catch syntax. And this is becoming even more prevalent now with Swift concurrency. It's not uncommon to see functions that use a try await functionality of async await. This means that the function may fail, thus a try. So in order to deal with that, we need to catch and deal with any errors that may come up. Now, sometimes you want to be specific about that exact type of error that you get and respond accordingly. And other times, it's just good enough to know that there had been some kind of error thrown, but you don't really care what that error was. So let's take a look at an example to see if it makes any sense and how we can use a guard statement to our advantage. This is some fictional API service that has a login function that accepts an optional string and tries to log in. It first uses if let to unwrap the optional like we did in the previous example. And if it's optional, it throws a type of error that's an API error using the no password enum. If it isn't optional, then we'll check to see if the password has fewer than six characters. And if so, we throw a, an API errors too short value. If the user uses the word password, and we'll check that by lower casing what they submitted, 
we'll reject by throwing a too easy error. What we need to do now is to create a function that will pass in a password to our API services login function and attempt to log in. And since this is a throwing function, we can use a do catch block. So what are we doing? Well, we're executing a function to find out if it's been successful. So we can call that return string status and try to use the API service passing in our password. If the execution was successful, then we can print that status out. If it wasn't successful, meaning it had thrown an error, we can print out that error. So let me uncomment these three lines, testing three different passwords, and execute our playground. It works fine. The word password is too easy. The string pass is too short, and great password is great, so our status is logged in. Now, I don't know about you, but that code has me jumping around a bit, so let's clean it up using a guard statement. Let me first copy in and paste the API service first and refactor it first, but still use that other function. I'm going to comment it out first and just leave it here for reference for now. So instead of if let, I'll use guard let. And if it's false, we'll immediately throw the no password error. Next, I'm going to check for the length to see if it's greater than or equal to six. If it isn't, I get that else failure case and I'm going to throw the too short error. And finally, I can check that the password's lower case is not the word password. If it is, we fail and it throws a too easy error. Having made it this far then, the result must be that we're logged in. So that will be our status to return. Let me copy our old function and test it out in this new API service. If I execute the code now, I get the same result. So this looks better, but as I mentioned at the outset of this page, sometimes I don't care what the error is. I only really want to know what to do if successful, and I'll respond the same way to all errors. So for this, we can use an optional try. Using an optional try, that's a try with a question mark, changes throwing functions into functions that returns an optional. If the function throws an error, that's when you'll get nil as a result. Otherwise, you'll get the return value wrapped as an optional. So if we don't care what the specific error is, we can use an optional try when calling a throwing function and then unwrap it if it's not nil. And we know how to unwrap because we use guard let. If it fails, we can simply print login failed, as with all guard statements, we have to exit the function, and we can do that with a premature return. If we made it through, however, we're past this and outside of the guard statements, we can print out the status that we got back. Testing once more, I see that we again get the same results as before, only we have much shorter but cleaner code and arguably easier to follow. The difference here is that in the second case with the optional try, we're handling all errors the same way. I hope that after watching this video, you'll have gained an appreciation of the guard statement and have some thoughts on how you might introduce them into your projects if you're not doing so already. If you like this video, please be sure to give it a thumbs up and leave a comment. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.